Beautiful. So, um, in order to understand the certification program that we developed, and that's really going to be the focus no, of this, you need to know a little bit about the university that we work at. So, um, Jessica is going to talk a little bit about that. So, I'm Jessica O'Brien, again, I'm the coordinator of instructional technology at Lenore Ron University and also a librarian. So, a little bit about our university. It's a comprehensive liberal arts university located in Hickory, North Carolina, which is about an hour northwest of Charlotte. And we have, um, we actually have two other campuses. So in 2012, we opened up a graduate center in Asheville, North Carolina. And so that serves completely graduate students. And then also in about 2012, we merged with the Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary in, in um, Columbia, South Carolina. And then two years later, we also opened a graduate center there. So while the Hickory campus is strictly focused, was strictly focused on undergraduates, our other two campuses are graduate education. And I should tell you that the size. So we're, we have 2,500 students combined, but about 1,000 of those are graduates, so at least 1,500 undergraduate students. A little bit about our pedagogies. Our pedagogies have traditionally been face-to-face -face because we serve the undergraduate population. So with the addition of our two campuses and 50 now, 30, 30 or 30, I think, um, online or master's programs, we've moved into pedagogy now that is looking more online and now blended learning. So um, as we're thinking about adopting and supporting blended learning at Lenore Ryan University, we found it helpful to think about the framework that um, Wendy Porter, Charles Graham, et al., the famous et al., offer for this. And that's to think about stage one at a university as being awareness and kind of exploration of blended learning. Um, stage two being beginning to think about adopting and beginning to think about support structures. And then stage three, I'm not sure why this keeps moving me forward, um, but we'll work with it. Um, getting to that stage of mature implementation. So you've got a clear plan, you know what you're doing, there are support structures in place. Lenore Ryan University, um, I would say right now, is probably about here. Uh, the work that Jessica is doing through the, um, as the coordinator of instructional technology and the work that I'm doing as uh, director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, one thing we're trying to do is to pull some things together to have a clear set of support structures. And that's really what we're, we're trying to work through in this presentation. Um, we also found it helpful, though, to think about, and I'm, I'm taking the cue here from um, Porter Graham et al., um, stages of faculty adoption. Going back to Everett Rogers, um, thinking about diffusion theory of technology, um, he notes that you have your innovators, your early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. Um, the innovators, the ones who are always out front, the laggards, the ones who will adopt new technologies only when they are absolutely forced to and really resist the, the change towards technology. Um, the literature that we've looked at on supporting blended learning says that your ideal is to focus here, your early adopters. Your innovators are already doing it. Uh, they're probably ahead of your support structures. Everyone else, they're only gonna start when they see that there are clear support structures in place. It's the early adopters who you can bring into the fold and say, let's, let's get working with this. I don't know how your institutions are. Um, Lenore Ryan is a tuition-driven institution. Um, we are working, in our, especially in our graduate programs, with a lot of uh, second career learners, people who are working full-time during the day. Um, there are a lot of reasons why people are moving towards blended learning, and um, as we talk about that, we realized over lunch that there are lots, so many different definitions. At LR, blended learning does mean replacing seat time with online um, activities. This is actually a better picture of who the faculty are who need support for blended learning at Lenore Rhine. Um, some innovators who are ready to go but want some support, some early adopters who we can get in pretty quickly, some people who are saying, I don't really want to do this, but my program says I have to. Uh, we have a, a Methodist studies program at the seminary that says all classes taught at a non-Methodist university must be fully online. We're a Lutheran university. By fully online, they mean more than 50% of the class happens face to face. Don't ask me. Um, <laughs> but for those faculty, a blended learning model makes a great deal of sense. They can do the 51% face to face, and then they can work to, pro to meet the needs of their students in online spaces for the other percentage of this. So we're kind of all over the map in terms of what our faculty need. And what Jessica and I saw as we were working with this 
is that historically, Lenore Ryan, through our offices, has done a, a really good job of providing support for face-to-face -face classroom activities. Uh, we've got some faculty doing some pretty creative stuff, some active and engaged learning. That piece of support is going well. We've also done well in providing support for online education. Uh, we have an online teaching certification program that all faculty who teach in online spaces are required to go through. When you start talking about pulling those two things together to pull the best of face-to-face -face and the best of technology, nothing. Um, our assumption is that people who teach well face-to-face -face will figure it out. People who teach well online will figure it out. And our experience has been that that simply is not accurate. So we came up with building on an inquiry-guided learning certification program that had worked exceptionally well, a blended learning certification program. And Jessica will kind of talk us through what that looks like. So these are the six learning outcomes or student learning outcomes for the certification. I'm not going to read them to you, but you'll have them here and it'll be in the slides that we promised to upload um, for you to look at later. And also I wanted to make sure we highlighted this book, The Blended Course Design Workbook by Katherine Linder. A few of our um, faculty in the Columbia cohort really, really latched onto this text and recommended it to their colleagues. So they felt it was really helpful and it really is a great introductory text to getting um, getting our faculty thinking about blended learning and then giving them a framework to work with in there as well. So our first cohort was at the Columbia campus and it consisted of five synchronous sessions. Um, almost, it will, yes, there are all five synchronous sessions combined with classroom, two classroom observations and then online instruction that, that went in um, in between the face-to-face the -face sessions. So prior to session one here, we asked everyone, there were six um, faculty, we asked them to read an article on blended learning and then to have, have a discussion in our learning management system, which we use Canvas, so that they could kind of develop a common vocabulary, common definitions, and kind of um, just sort of to, to start to build that sense of community between them before we met in person. Uh, the first time we met was a four hour window. We drove to Columbia, uh, where they're about two and a half hours away from our, our campus in Hickory. We met with the six faculty, and the first thing that we asked them to do was to use some technology to develop an introduction to introduce themselves to one another. Three of our faculty were from the seminary, two were from the graduate OT program, and two were from, our, or one was from our graduate counseling. Um, program. So well, they see each other on campus, but they didn't know each other very well. So we asked them to use some technology that they might be using in a blended learning format in order to create introductions. So one person used a Pinterest board to, to kind of introduce themselves. Um, some used presentation software like Prezi or Google Drive, and then um, a few used a, a word cloud, so Taxedo or um, Wordle, to, to um, introduce themselves. And for a lot of them, for probably five of the six of them, it was the first time they'd used a technology that um, use that technology for anything, let alone in, in a different format. So again, taking Pinterest and repurposing it. So it gave them that framework of, of things that they could think about using in their own blended classroom. Between the first session and the second session, we asked them to work in that blended uh, learning course design book and then to collaborate on a Google Doc. And then coming into the second session, they had that foundation again with the blended, they were able to do some things outside of class. And then once we got together for our one hour class, we were able to work with them um, specifically designing assessments. So again, in this first session, we talked about backward design. Some of them were familiar with the Wiggins and McTie um, understanding, understanding by design. Yes. Understanding by design fr uh, framework where you develop your learning outcomes and then you work to build um, effective assessments and then look at the learning experiences and the instruction. So first, they developed the learning outcomes up here. We designed the assessments, deciding which should be online, which would work best face-to-face. -face. Again, more work outside of there. The third session, they mapped those courses. So where they wanted the learning experience, what would be online, what would not be. Um, the individual sessions, they broke up and met with uh, Devin, we tried to do three and three, but I think it ended up to be five and one, Devin got most of them. Worked one on one for an hour with the faculty, answering any questions they still had about the process, alleviating any anxieties that they had about what they were doing, and preparing them to do their class observation, both to teach with a colleague in the room and how uncomfortable that can feel sometimes, as well as filling out, um, it, it wasn't an evaluation form, it was an observation form. Finally, our last three-hour session, 
focused, uh, we had a focus group, so we asked them what worked well for them, what surprised them, how did they think they're going to use it, and then we asked them to create a very short, on the fly, 10 minute blended presentation um, that would answer the question if your colleague came to you with a, a problem, would blended learning be a solution for them? So kind of integrating everything that they've learned into a short 10 minute presentation. And just for clarification, um, everything from step one through step four happened the semester prior to teaching the course for the first time. Um, in between step four and five, they're teaching it, then the final session was at the end of that session. And now we can move to this slide that you've already seen about six times. <laughs> um, following the first time that we did this with our Columbia faculty, um, we offered it on our Hickory campus, and we ran into some real challenges there. Um, the in terms of adopting technology, the Columbia campus would fall into that late majority slash laggard group. Uh, they had reasons why they needed to do it, but they were not thrilled about it. Um, the Hickory cohort, we walked into a room full of really accomplished instructors. Um, two of the, the original six who applied for that program in Hickory had won our university-wide teaching award. Um, they have a long track record of faculty development work. Most the of them have. Hickory had, campus undergrad? Undergrad with some graduate, but our, okay. our main campus um, that has traditionally supported undergrad. Um, many of them have gone through our inquiry guided learning certification program and the online teaching certification, so they've got a lot of the background. Uh, they are our innovators and early adopters, and one of them who ended up not doing the program but was part of the applicant pool literally wrote a book on blended learning. Um, so for us to walk in and start talking about doing backward design with them, they would have walked out of the room because this is stuff that they have already known. Um, so with the Hickory cohort, we had to change things up quite a bit. Um, we had to work with what blended learning offers best and to say that traditional model that we thought we had already figured out is not going to work here, what will? What will work are personalized pathways, finding out what the individual people sitting in that room needed. Um, we pushed them higher on that higher order thinking skills, Bloom's taxonomy. Um, so on the first day, rather than walking in and saying, let's talk about what backward design is, understanding it's, you already know this, Let's put you to work applying that. What are the tools that you can use electronically, the tools that you can use face-to-face -to, -face to get your students doing what you want them to do? And we really focused on collaboration in this cohort. Uh, most of the sessions ended up being workshopping sessions rather than instruction sessions. And we were very upfront with them that Jessica and I really didn't have anything to teach them. We were co-learners in this together. So our participants would walk in with, here are the outcomes that I've designed for this course. Let's talk about them. Here are the assessments that I've designed. What do you think? How could I modify this? What would what what expertise do you bring that might work? We're trying to really move through this. We're going to go to takeaways from um, from our learning experience. Uh, some of you mentioned that you have similar kinds of programs, and we would love to hear from you all what's working for you. Others of you, though, it may be that this is something you take back to your campus and say some ideas here for how we might better support blended learning. Um, first, we would say build on strengths. Uh, we housed ours out of our joint offices largely because we had already established a lot of credibility with our faculty. Even the, the faculty who didn't really want to be adopting blended learning, they're pretty happy with us because we're one of the, the few groups on campus that actually takes the time to drive down to the Columbia campus regularly. Um, we already had people, as I mentioned, who had been through several of our programs and had reported success with them. So that was an area of real strength for us to, to have kind of a base on which to build. Um, that may not be the case on your campus. Um, I, you know, I know we still have a, a lot of colleges and universities that don't have the resources for a Center for Teaching and Learning or that faculty development work is distributed outwards to different places. So it's kind of think about where are your faculty already going and how can we build this in? The second one that we didn't talk about yet, um, we established a contractual obligation with the faculty who were in this program. Um, they had stipends of $1,000 per person doing this uh, that came out of the Teaching and Learning Committee's budget. So we, we agreed that this is a priority. It's something that needs to be supported. In our conversations with faculty, both in the blended learning setting, but also in that previous iteration of this, in the Inquiry Guided Learning Certification, we heard over and over and over again how important that contract was. Um, not for the stipend. Every one of them said $1,000 is nice, but that's not enough to motivate me to, to do this. 
it was the contract that said, this is a priority. And probably of the 18 or 20 people that we've talked to in focus groups and individual interviews, they reported back to us that almost every single one at some point in the process said, I may not go to this today because I have other stuff. And then it's that contractual obligation. This is, this is really important. And they ended up prioritizing the faculty development work. Our third takeaway is to apply principles of blended learning. So to really think about what works best in an online asynchronous, asynchronous format compared to what would work better face-to-face. -face. So thinking about giving them time for, or giving them some choice in the time, the place, the pathway, the format. So to make sure that you um, prioritize again between those two. Four, to allow and even create some discomfort. The discomfort also came, um, we learned afterwards, we didn't mean for the classroom observation, the peer-to-peer -peer observation to be uncomfortable, but some of them were very, very nervous about that. And um, they, they found that it was worthwhile and reported back they were glad they did it. They were very nervous for that. Um, we were thinking of the fact, we gave them an article and we asked them to use mind mapping software. We used bubble.us and asked them to collaborate on that and try to map out the article how difficult they found it was, but then they think about the, the examples or the assignments that they give to their students. So they kind of took that role to think about what piece of technology are you using and is it the best piece of technology for whatever task or the learning outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, that, that was really an eye-opening moment when they said, ooh, cool technology and what you asked us to do with it did not work at all um, <laughs> to, to be in that role of the student. Um, Final thing was to, to think about adopting appropriate models of presence. Um, and this is drawing some from online teaching theory, but um, you know the three modes of presence, the instructor to learner presence, learner to learner presence, and learner to content presence. In um, surveying and focus groups, uh, participants reported back that each of those was important. Uh, many of them valued the expertise that we brought, although Jessica and I would both not want to claim that, but they would they would say that it's nice to have that expert there who is working with you. But we were surprised to the extent to which they found the peer-to-peer -peer collaboration valuable. Um, they said they learned as much from the classroom observations as from anything else, and that was just awesome to hear because that was one of the goals. And then we also heard that one of the real values of it was simply carving out the time to be with the material, to work with it, to think it through individually and alone. Um, so all three of those modes of presence. By way of conclusion, um, I want to go to um, a quote from an article in um, Leadership Magazine, so going outside of our academic sphere, uh, describing blended learning. We are immersed in a paradigm shift in learning whereby blended learning has emerged as a flexible, differentiated, updated approach to learning. Um, I think what we would say is that that can apply to the support for blended learning as much as it can to the blended learning itself, that support for those who are embarking on this, it's a paradigm shift for them. And they need for us and their universities to be flexible in thinking about how we support to be sure to differentiate the instruction so that we're not trying a one-size-fits-all model where what we had planned for one group of faculty would have been a complete disaster for another group, to, to have that differentiated space and updated, um, to think about moving, at least for us, moving faculty development into an online space was actually a little uncomfortable because despite talking about it a lot, we do an awful lot face to face. So um, we will leave it there. Hope to have some conversation at the end. And with that, we will actually turn it over to the multimedia side of things <laughs> from this point. So thank you.